Hi, and welcome back to the History Hut. I'm Jim, this is Dr. K, and uh, this episode we'll be talking about the MacDonald era of Canadian politics, I suppose. And uh, am I right to think that John A. MacDonald dominates the decades after Confederation? He absolutely does. He's not actually in power for the whole time, but even when he's not in power, he's he's such a you know larger-than-life character that you just can't seem to get rid of him. Uh, he'd <laughs> actually... They often talk about the McDonald era kind of going from 1867 all the way up to 1896 when Wilfrid Laurier comes to power. The funny thing about that, of course, is that McDonald dies in 1891. So, <laughs> so, so such is the power of the man that, that we consider that, that, you know, the other politicians more or less follow the same game plan. Uh, it's just that some are more successful than others. So in or out of power, he, he just dominates Canadian political life. And I think it's because there was a general consensus amongst all politicians, um, unlike some countries today, <laughs> <laughs> there's a general consensus about what was needed to build the country. And the first thing was uh, opening the prairies to settlement. You had to get people out there because remember the fear that the Americans might want our west. Uh, building a railway east-west to link the, the, the whole country together. And then um, the third one was an economic policy. And that varied through that period. But at first it was, of course, trying to achieve uh, reciprocity with uh, the Americans again. Everybody wants a free trade, a free trade deal with the with the states. So um, the the process of nation building. We talked the other day about it physically being in place, but you know you've, you've got the constitutional girdle on it. But you know how when when is the moment when people start to feel more Canadian than more Nova Scotian or more anything else? So so the process of nation building is is a kind of key concern, and. Um, it becomes known, this policy becomes known in in the late 1870s, 1878, as the, the national policy. So you quite often hear them talk about the national policy. So uh, it's important to examine how the consensus is achieved and then how it's maintained. And then, of course, there's a little scandal along the way. <laughs> so we'll have a look at, at, at that as well. So for MacDonald, I think opening up the West is the absolute key to, to everything. And, and that's why you get, of course, the Manitoba Act and then the Northwest Territories Act and uh, the treaties that we'll be talking about. Uh, and, of course, the guarantee of a railway to BC within 10 years as soon yeah. as it comes into Confederation. So uh, we talked about this uh, a few times before that, that he believed the railway was, was really, really important. To this whole process. Yeah, and it almost sounds like an obvious question, but but why was building the railroad so important to McDonald and, and who would end up building it? Well, that's so obvious, I'm not even going to answer it. It's <laughs> over there. A silly thing. <laughs> uh, well, remember, we've talked a little bit about the red line or the imperial line and how he felt that that would make Canada more valued in, in, within the empire in the, in the eyes of the, the Brits, I suppose. And um, he hired uh, Sanford Fleming to go west to start the survey. Now, I just want to read you a little thing as I so often do and it's just about it's from 1871 and it's how you got to the west so remembering of course you know that even in 1860 and 70 they couldn't get troops out to the the Red River uh, Rebellion so this is a little quote before uh, Canada's Pacific Railway a traveller could reach Red River, River by the difficult Dawson Trail north of Superior or by rail down to St. Paul in Minnesota and then by steamboat down river to Winnipeg uh, and so on April Fool's Day, 1871, the Ottawa Department of Public Works advertised the conditions for intending immigrants to the Northwest Territory. It would cost $30 for an adult passage from Toronto to Fort Garry, half of that for children under 12. The 96 miles from the Ontario capital to Collingwood on Georgian Bay were covered by train. The 632 miles from there to Fort William covered by steamer. The next short lap of 45 miles uh, was on what passed for a wagon road and then from the end of the road to the northwest angle of Lake of the Woods, a distance of 310 miles. Emigrants travelled in open boats, making numerous portages with their baggage on their backs, all the while carrying their own rations. So you can see why he's probably thinking, well, not a lot of people are going to want to, you know, go, they're not going to get millions flooding that route. That would be really um, quite difficult. So 
for him, the railway is really important. Uh, and and we'll, we'll keep talking about the railway over and over because it becomes mm. so much a part of uh, Canadian political life. So uh, he acknowledged that it would be cheaper to build the line south of the Great Lakes. So it makes more sense to build it kind of, you know, in American territory and out to our west. But of course, he wants it to be an all Canadian line. This is part of the whole deal, the imperial mm -hmm. line. So it has to be that. So north of the, to the north of the Great Lakes is a, a really nasty piece of territory. But that was going to be the route. And uh, it would go from Portage La Prairie uh, to Edmonton, and then it would go on to the Yellowhead Pass, and then to a land terminus in BC opposite Nanaimo, and then uh, go across by ferry, and then south on the rail to Victoria. Now, I have actually taken the train all the way across Canada, and I can tell you that from Winnipeg to Toronto, it's still, I think it's still like 16 hours or something. It's just really quite uh, um, spectacularly barren sort <laughs> of a way to go. So you're right. You know, he wants it to be an all Canadian line, and then the the debate moves on to who's going to build it. Now, it's so important to him that you'd think he'd have been able to kind of force the issue, but he he uh, he will only learn from his own mistakes. <laughs> so there's two groups interested: uh, the the Montreal syndicate under Sir Hugh Allen, and then a Toronto syndicate under Macdonald's friend Senator David McPherson. So it was seen as kind of French ver French Canada versus English Canada, of course. Cartier uh, like this to go to Montreal, but uh, it's viewed as a battle between the interests of of the two the two parts of the country, and we see that in the modern period as well. Sometimes there'll be a huge uh, contract awarded, and people will be like, "Well, will it go to Quebec or will it come to yeah. the West?" Right. So, I mean, this is this is uh, the beginning of that. Uh, so he, I think, you know, he looking back, he should have been able to force the two syndicates to come together and make a deal with them and get the railway done. But uh, but he doesn't. And he's uh, a little worried because there are already a lot of people who are in the States who have made their fortune with the American railway. And he doesn't want there to be any American money behind this at all. So it's a very interesting story. So 1872, uh, Cartier announces the, the government's incentive. So whoever won the contract to build the railway uh, in 10 years would get $30 million in public funds and 50 million acres of public land. So which you'd be able to sell for, you know, a whack of money afterwards. Mm -hmm. And it's an election um, and it's election time and McDonald's in trouble because of the Treaty of Washington member you know they all thought they'd ended his career he fought back uh, and and he's in trouble over what we're seeing as really overly generous railway promises <laughs> to BC which we've already talked about but when the polls close the votes are counted the Conservatives are back in power but with a very slim slim majority and I think it's thanks to the extra MPs that BC got um, <laughs> so the Conservatives carry Quebec as usual for that time lost Ontario and then split New Brunswick and, and Nova Scotia. So it's not the best uh, of results. So 1873, everything's set uh, thanks to Cartier's influence. Sir Hugh Allen gets the gets the you know the the, the big uh, charter. So he gets the CPR charter. John A. Macdonald establishes a Department of the Interior as well. And uh, also, of course, by 1873, the the first three treaties have been signed out west. So everything's going along, you know, quite well. And you're thinking. Yeah, I think you can do it. That's what you're probably thinking to yourself. I you yeah, think you could probably absolutely. do it. Really? I have the benefit of being in present day, though, and I, oh. I, I think there is a railway. That, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but I, I, oh, you're so smart. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure there's some kind of scandal that pops yes, up. Yes, there's, there's a little bit of a problem. So it looks like everything's absolutely fine. And then disaster strikes. And it's a great little political Which you scandal. historians love. Oh, we do. We're like, oh, thank <laughs> heavens, because it was getting a little boring for a while there. So it's like everything was going well. So uh, the McPherson group were really angry. David McPherson's group angry at not getting the contract. So they paid to have the law offices of Allen's partner, Hugh Allen's partner, JJC Abbott, broken into. So it's our own little Watergate, just way ahead of time. Oh, boy. Right, so it turns out that uh, from the stuff that they find, it turns out that Sir Hugh Allen had contributed about $350,000 to the Conservative campaign. Now, in those days, there wasn't such a great separation, or the one that we pretend, between politics and economics. So people that were directors of companies were also, you know, nowadays, if you're a politician, you have to put your stuff into a blind trust while you're an MP so that you don't benefit from it. But, uh, you know, $350,000 is a lot to contribute, and it included a hefty amount to George Etienne Cartier. So a huge, you know, oh. a substantial amount to him. 
And the worst part was that, I mean, it was like a great scandal, uh, incriminating telegrams from Cartier to Allen, and uh, one in particular from McDonald to Cartier saying, can you get me 10,000 more? You know, just to kind of Ooh. get the election. So I, that suddenly this, you know, this becomes public knowledge because it's, it's brought to the house. So they're copied and left outside the doors of prominent liberals in plain brown envelopes. That wouldn't probably be what you'd expect in a plain brown envelope. You'd probably think it was something really, really terrible. But <laughs> uh, the liberals brought their copies to Parliament and, of course, tried to accuse MacDonald of collusion and corruption. And this is all, after the fact, referred to as the Pacific Scandal. Because Canadian Pacific Charter, right? Specific scandal. So it's very interesting. And there's some absolutely, uh, I think the Welland Telegraph um, in particular, but some absolutely wonderful political cartoons from the period, you know, I showing, can only imagine. Yeah, showing John A. <laughs> MacDonald um, and, and he's the, the he's the judge, the jury, the prosecution, the defendant, and, you know, and then and then uh, key conservatives whitewashing one side of MacDonald while the liberals put black paint on the other side. It's just absolutely marvelous, marvelous stuff. So MacDonald, he's not really sure uh, what they have on him. And, and you know, he absolutely is a wonderful defense he says uh, and it's true that this guy had the guy that was involved mcmullen had brought the the letters to him and more or less kind of threatened to blackmail him and he said get stuffed off you go and so he said so i know they came to me first and now you've bought them so you know you you've bought stuff off these uh, these terrible um, these terrible people and they're all like oh no we didn't do that uh <laughs> so it's really really interesting and uh, of course they have the speeches in the house and uh mcdonald eventually uh, has to defend himself so he defends himself in this fabulous about five hour speech in the commons he waits and waits and waits until the liberals um, at first, this is before he starts drinking, <laughs> before he starts defending himself. Uh, he waits and he's hoping that, that the Liberals will say everything that they have. And then he just like leaves the house and goes up to his office and he's there for a while. And he says to somebody, you have the Liberals, you know, spoken yet? And they go, oh, well, you know, the top guy hasn't said, it's, um, Blake hasn't spoken yet. And he says, oh, well, I... I get, um, you know, I think I'll have to. So, so it looks as though they'd been hoping that he would kind of drink himself into a stupor and be incapable of defending himself. But nonetheless, you know, late at night, starts his defence, five-hour speech at least, uh, and has the page bring him glasses of water all the way through. Except they're, it's not water; it's gin. So he's he's drinking more and more and more as night goes on, and he gets better and better and better. Just this incredibly capable defense, and he says, you know, after all I've done for my little country, you know, I had its best interests at heart. How could you ever think I would, you know, I would try and rip it off? It, it's absolutely marvelous, and it almost works for him because <laughs> the liberals are just like, because they're the the party of the teetotalers, you know, so they're like. <gasps> Oh, there he goes again, you know, Mr. Charisma. And uh, it almost works for him. But Donald Smith, who was um, one of the men that had negotiated with the Métis at Red River and who was a chief factor of the Hudson Bay Company, later Lord Strathcona, uh, he said... When it came to the bit, it was a really close vote. He said that he wouldn't support him. He wasn't sure if MacDonald had actually done something wrong, but the PM should never be in the situation where it might be perceived that he had done something wrong. And so everybody's like, oh my God, <laughs> this is terrible. So he stays away from Parliament and the Ottawa headlines are um, Prime Minister ill and un uh, unable to attend. But uh, uh, according to Pierre Burton, at, at this point, um, he was gone for like a couple of weeks and not even his wife knew where he was and people were like oh what's happened to him you know huh. he's just had like a breakdown or what but uh he was away um thinking things through so he didn't really have any option he had to resign so he resigns in november of 1873 Cartier is uh, thankfully spared the humiliation of having to come back and face this kind of scandal because he dies he's in London getting funding for the railway still and he dies he has Bright's disease and so he dies of Bright's disease and MacDonald has to set up a royal commission to look into the allegations against his party and uh, they're upheld <laughs> and the worst thing of all was it was made public at this point as well that Hugh Allen's financial backers were American so it was the one thing that he had never wanted that he'd always wanted to avoid so it was like shock horror Al Hugh Allen's forced to give up the charter MacDonald resigns they call an election and um, you know, the election of course overturns his government and, and there's a new government comes in but the consensus is so strong about the, the need for the railway uh, that, that it, it doesn't 
it doesn't end with that at all. So it, it, it's the end of, it looks like it might be the end of McDonald's political career because this is you mm-hmm. know, quite something Big to stuff. get over. Yeah. But uh, so he does everything he possibly can to get through it. But, but then first liberal government comes to power. So, yeah. Well, we hate to leave you on a cliffhanger like this. <gasps> oh, no. But we're going to. We're absolutely going <laughs> dun, to. Dun, dun, dun. So in part two. Will the liberals get in? <laughs> yeah, sure. Will McDonald recover? <laughs> Tune I in don't next. Know. <laughs> if he's that corrupt, surely he was able to buy himself well, back into the house. But oh, could he? Oh, would he? Could he now? <laughs> and would it have to be American money? Yeah. <laughs> would it be Canadian dollars or American was, was silver? It, was it, was it on par at that time? I, uh, was there any parity? I'm not sure. Well, we'll oh, find no, out sure. in part two. Okay. <laughs>